Let's stand up and worship. Our God reigns over all the earth, and He reigns over all the heavens. He made the firmament to exalt His name, for great is the Lord, and most worthy. the sea resound and all within it let the fields be jubilant and sing for joy for great is the lord and most worthy of our praise sing to the lord a new song sing all the earth sing to the lord Praise Him, proclaim His great word. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing all the earth. Sing to the Lord and praise Him. Proclaim His great word. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. Church. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy of our praise. He is holy. He is holy. I will praise him all my days. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing all the earth. Proclaim his great word, sing to the Lord a new song, sing all the earth, sing to the Lord and praise him, proclaim his great word. He is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy. a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies yeah. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Watch her sing. Oh, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. a hallelujah I 
I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. Here you lost your hold on me. Oh, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. Hey! All right, y'all, I missed you. You ready to sing? All right, here we go. Sing a little louder. 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 told pastor earlier it felt like I was gone for a month um we drove all the way up to New York State um to see some family um but it just is different to be in the house of the Lord like we had we had rehearsal on Thursday and it was good to be back with the band but it's great to be in this house and it's great that you're here so thank you for being here thank you for worshiping um this is your worship this is your worship time we've We've prepared. We're, we're here as worship leaders, not as performers. So I want to encourage you to lift up your voices today and just um, honor and glorify our God and everything that he's done. Let's continue to worship. Actually, let's pray. <laughs> Lost my head. Jesus, we just want to thank you and praise you. Thank you for the rain and thank you for everyone here for getting us here safely. God, thank you for your presence in this place. And as we raise a hallelujah, Lord, you, you, you fill us. Somehow something changes and it um, shifts in our spirit. And I'm so thankful for that. God, our, our joy is welled up and that makes you smile. Lord, we praise you. 
And as we continue to, to worship you and also worship with you with our tithes and our offerings, Lord, I pray that you would take those tithes and offerings. I pray that you would multiply it, bless it, and use it to further your kingdom, Lord, with all these different mission um, opportunities, Lord, for this re the remainder of this year with Love Denver and um, and I want to say Hope for Hunger, the, 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 the Rise Against Hunger, thank you. Lord, I pray that your blessings would, would pour out over those opportunities. God, we love you and we praise you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this place and that, that we would be full. God, fill our spirits with you. Push out all the other junk <laughs> and fill it with you. We need you, not all the other junk. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Send your fire down, send your fire down, yeah. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us, come rest on us. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us, come rest on us, come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Hey. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come down. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Let that be your prayer. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Yeah. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Fill the room. You're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Yeah. Holy Spirit, calm down. Holy Spirit. 
Spirit, come down today. Holy Spirit, we just want to thank you. Thank you for your presence here tonight, today. Lord, have your way. You are God and we are not. I want to lift up our pastor as he comes and shares your word. God, you have spoken to him and prepared his heart, Lord. I pray that you would speak through him and use him for your glory. And God, prick us where we need to be pricked. Your will isn't for us to just be idle or to be stagnant. We need to be growing in you. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us just a little nugget to walk out with and chew on and change in our lives to walk a little closer with you. God, if we just walk a little closer every day, what a difference that will make in everybody's life. Everybody we touch, not only our own lives. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Again, have your way. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. Whether you're here in person or whether you're joining us online, we want to welcome you as we celebrate and, and worship with God today. It's good to see all of you today. So who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? That's what we're going to talk about today. Who is my neighbor? You know, this past Monday, we, we celebrated Independence Day, July the 4th, and, and uh, I, I enjoyed scrolling through Facebook and, and all those posts that all of you posted, you know, the parades, the fireworks, and, and all the gatherings, and some of them were gatherings of neighbors gathering together to celebrate uh, together, uh, laughing and, and, and enjoying each other's company. And, and I thought that was wonderful. And, and, and I expect that for, for most of us, if, 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 our neighbor, if our neighbor was in need, you know, we'd respond, wouldn't we? If our neighbor said, I, I need your help, that we, we would say, yes, neighbor, I'm here for you. I'll help you, you know. I'm helping you. I mean, after all, it's our neighbor, right? Well, this morning, this morning, what we're going to look at this morning is we're going to take a look at um, a challenge that Jesus puts before us. Okay, Jesus puts a challenge before us, and, and that is to take a look at just exactly who our neighbor is. Who our neighbor is. You ever really thought about it? Who our neighbor is? Now, folks, in the world that we live in, uh, you know, it's becoming increasingly harder and harder and, and even more difficult to reach out to our neighbor. Now, we might know the person that lives on this side of us or that side of us or maybe in front of us or behind us, but when we get beyond that little circle, Sometimes it's hard to, to reach out to, to see who our neighbor is. And um, there's other, many reasons for that. Maybe, maybe it's because we just don't take the time anymore to go around and visit our neighbor. You know, don't sit out on the porch anymore and, and talk to our neighbors. Or, or, or maybe, maybe there's other reasons. Maybe we, just, maybe we just don't want our neighbor to know our business. You know, we just don't want to get too friendly with them. We don't want to let them know too much about ourselves. Or, or maybe we don't want to know too much about them. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. And in some situations, uh, we're really afraid of how our neighbor is going to react to us, you know. Uh, they think I'm too, too friendly or too neighborly, you know. I'll share a story with you about my neighbor. Years ago, Beth and I, we were living in a parsonage. And, and I mowed the yard in the parsonage. I, I, I would mow the grass. Well, my neighbor... Uh, they, they didn't stay at this house, but just once in a while they would come and visit, you know, once a month or once every couple months. So I noticed that my neighbor's grass was getting a little bit high, you know, and I thought, well, I'm going to do the neighborly thing. I'm going to mow my neighbor's grass. I'll mow it for him, and then, then when he comes, it'll be mowed. And I did. The next day, my neighbor showed up, but he wasn't a very happy neighbor. It looks like that while I mowed the grass and did a wonderful job of mowing his grass, I'd also mowed over all his saplings that he'd planted along as a border. <laughs> now, fortunately, he was a good neighbor, and we replaced the saplings, me and him, and we got to be real good friends. But anyway, I learned a lesson. Ask first. So anyway, 
not all deeds, not all deeds have happy endings, do they? Well, this morning Jesus shares a story with us that stretches our limits, stretches our limits when it comes to our neighbor. And the story is found in the Gospel of Luke. It's a story that you're all probably familiar with, Luke chapter 10, verses uh, 25 through 37. You probably heard the story hundreds of times. It's, it's called the Good Samaritan. Yeah. But what I'm asking you to do this morning is let, 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 stop thinking about the story. You know, how many times have you read the story? You probably could quote some of the passages in that story. But put that out of your mind. Let God speak to you. Let God speak to you through this story, okay? So we're going to talk about that this morning. Uh, it begins like this. It says, just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Now let that soak in a little bit. Now folks, I think there's not a one of us here among us that can honestly say that you've never tested Jesus. Never questioned Jesus. So we all are standing in the sandals of this lawyer. We've done it at one time or another. We put Jesus to the test. But here's what this lawyer says. He says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay. We're going we're gonna to walk with Jesus and the disciples for the next few months and, and listen to some of Jesus' teachings and stories and see how they impact our lives. But what you're going to find out, that as he goes through this time, Jesus is constantly, constantly being tested. He is constantly being questioned. He is constantly, his teachings are being challenged. And it continues today. Now what I want you to see, throw that screen back up there if you can for just a minute. Here's what I want you to see about this first passage of Scripture. Look what it says. Look what it says about the lawyer. Do you see that? What does he ask Jesus? What must I do to inherit eternal life? You see, everything is surrounded by this lawyer. I. What must I do? That's his only interest is what's in it for me. How can I? I don't, I don't care about you. I don't care about you. But what about me? Okay? Now, Jesus responds to this question, and he asks the question himself. He says, what's written in the law? What's written in the law? Now, now what Jesus, is, he's referring to a passage of Scripture here that this man knows. The, the passage is found in Leviticus, Leviticus 19.18. Okay? That's the book of the law. And here's what it says. It says, you shall not take vengeance. Or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, folks, in the Old Testament readings, where the scripture ends and says, I am the Lord, or thus says the Lord, that means that the Lord is speaking it. This is the way it is. Okay? I am the Lord. This passage, the, the lawyer would have known this passage. He's a lawyer. He's a scholar man. He knows the scriptures. He would have learned this. He may have even probably was tested by one of the rabbis to quote this passage of scripture. So he knew it. And he responds. So Jesus responds to him and says this. What do you read there? Now what's Jesus asking him? Jesus has asked him to explain. How do you see this passage? How do you interpret it? What does it mean to you? Not just the words, but how do you, you, you see it and understand it? I want to know so that there's no misunderstanding. So tell me in your own words. And the man, of course, being educated and a lawyer, okay, but well-versed, I could see him, he just kind of swelled out his chest, you know. Well, Jesus, here's what it means to me. And he answered him. And he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind, and your neighbors yourself. See, he knew that passage of Scripture. He didn't have to look it up. He didn't have to Google it. He knew it. Now, the first part of this, this, this Scripture, it's obvious, Right? You want eternal life? Uh, you you got to love God, right? They knew that. The only way to inherit eternal life is to love God. 
Do you know that there's people who, 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 who do not claim to be Christian and, and, and that love God? That they say, well, I love God. And there's people that, that, that don't profess to God as their Lord that in their time of need, who are they going to call on? Well, a lot of times they call on God. They call on God. I mean, what's so hard about loving someone who gave you life? That's not hard, is it? What's so hard about, about loving somebody who, 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 when you needed strength, is there for you, who, who, who's your hope and, and help in time of need? Well, that's not hard, is it? But to love your neighbor, mm, that's something a little bit different. Love a neighbor, that, 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 that's a little bit different. But the scripture didn't say just love your neighbor, did it? It said love your neighbor as yourself. Now that's really hard. And here's what Jesus replies. He said to him, he said, well, you've given the right answer. Do this and you'll live. The story should have ended right there, folks. Right? I mean, Jesus laid it out there. There it is. You know the answer. Do it and live. Yeah. But look what the lawyer does. Wanting to justify himself. He asked him, who's my neighbor? Wanting to justify. Folks, now let's not be too hard on this lawyer. Because I expect every one of us has attempted to justify our ways with God. Yeah, God, but we're dog sitting uh, this week or this weekend, and, and, and my daughter's got three dogs, and I go to let them out. Well, I go let those dogs out, and they go running around the yard, and they get to the edge of the yard, and I say, come here. And then they come running back, and they go over to the woods, and I'll say, come here, and they'll come running back. They've got boundaries. I've established these boundaries. And that's what this lawyer's wanting Jesus to do. Create me some boundaries. Show me how far I can go to love my neighbor. Show me exactly just how big my neighborhood is. And folks, we do the same thing, don't we? Yes, we do the same thing, whether it's ourselves or whether it's churches. <laughs> When I, when I first become a minister, uh, uh, somebody come up to me and, and they said, now preacher said, now I want to tell you something. I said, what? And they said, I want you to know that your line goes right here. I said, what do you mean? They said, this road right here, you, you don't go any further. When you cross that road over there, that goes to the other church. You can't get people on that church. And I said, well, I didn't know the Lord drew lines. You know, but that's the way we are, aren't we? We, want, we, we have boundaries or uh, you, we go this far. Yeah. So we don't need to be so hard on the lawyer. We say things like, you know, what do you, what, what, what do you mean do not steal? You know, what if I just cheat just a little bit? Or, or what do you mean thou shalt not covet? How far can I go to where I fall into that threshold of coveting? Yeah. But the problem with the lawyer and the problem with us is that we fail to keep the very first covenant, don't we? And that's to love God. Love God with our total self. There lies the problem. You see what the lawyer says? He's wanting those boundaries, okay? Okay. So Jesus does what Jesus always does. He throws out a story. And the story is so that we can place ourselves in this story and we can come up with the answer ourselves. So Jesus tells this story and it goes like this. It says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, they beat him, and they, they went away leaving him for dead. Now folks, historically... The road from Jerusalem to Jericho is the most dangerous highway in all of Rome. Now, let me explain that, okay? Jerusalem's a big city, and that's where the temple is. The Jews had to travel to the Jerusalem to pay their temple tax once a year. So they had money on them, okay? 
The robbers knew they had money on them. The other thing about Jerusalem is that's where the market was. So people would travel from the countryside to the market to sell their goods. So they had wares on them that the robbers knew they had. And if they were coming back from Jerusalem, they knew that they had sold their merchandise and they had money on them. So they were prone to be robbed. Yeah. Most dangerous highway around. And the scripture goes on and says this. It says, now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he pressed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place they saw him, he pressed on by the other side. Now, I want to stop here just a minute and look at these two men, okay? These two men, they represent something. They represent the people. The priesthood is actually divided in, into three groups of individuals. It's divided into what they call the high priest. And the high priest was the one that conducted all the sacrifices and things in the temple in Jerusalem. That was the high priest's his location. And then you had the priest, and those priests, they conducted everything that went on in the synagogues outside of Jerusalem. Okay, were the priests. And then you had the Levites. Now, the Levites are a special tribe in Jerusalem. If you go back to when, when the people were freed, Moses freed the people, and you remember they went to the mount, and he went on top of the mount. Anybody know what they did while he was on top of the mountain? Hey, thank you back there. Golden calf, the golden calf. The Levites were the one tribe that refused to bow down to the golden calf. And because they refused to bow down to the golden calf, this is the order or the tribe that God selected the priest from. Okay? So they were a select group of priests, uh, people. Now, all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. Okay? Make sense? Okay. So... Here's the deal. Maybe they had something important to do. They had to go to the temple and make sacrifices. They didn't have time for this man. They had to carry up God's business. Okay? They were in charge of higher things. Maybe they had to go to the synagogue. They had things to do. And, and if they messed with this man who was laying there bleeding and dying, then they would become unclean. And if they were unclean, then they couldn't carry out their religious commitment. So they crossed over to the other side. And this Levite, well, I don't know, he was special. You know, they were a special group of people. But they were special, but not who they were, but how God used them. But they were expected to separate themselves from the others. From, you know, the common folk. I mean, after all, he brought it on himself, didn't he? He had money on him. He had something that was worth robbing. He got what he deserved, right? Well, let's go on. The scripture says, A Samaritan, while traveling near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. And the scripture says that he went to him, he bandaged his wounds, and having poured oil and wine on them, then he put him on his own animal, and he brought him to an end, and he took care of him. Now Jesus uses a Samaritan because in the eyes of the Jews, in the eyes of this lawyer, the Samaritans were pagans. Okay? They didn't worship the true God. They were seen as pagans. So the first thing I see in this story about this Samaritan is that he comes near him. Did you catch that in the passage of Scripture? It says that when he came near him, that means he had to move to him. He didn't see him from just the other side of the street. He saw someone there and he goes near him. Now what does that tell us? Folks, if you want to know who your neighbor is, you got to get out of that door. you got to go to the other side of the street. you got to get near your neighbor. 
you've got to get outside your comfort zone. It's easy to sit in our little neighborhood and say, all is well in the world. Life is good. Until we really get near our neighbor and see the need. Not only does he see the need, but the scripture says that he has pity. He took pity. What does that mean? Well, that means he didn't just say, well, I'm going to pray for you, brother. I'm going to pray for you. Here you go. I'll give you a few bucks. I hope you get along good now. No. He puts himself in this man's place. That's what it means to have pity on somebody. You put yourself in their situation. You begin to understand their struggle. You realize that if I don't do something here, this man's going to die. And the scripture says that he, he, he served, he gave to him. He reached out to him. From the other side of the street, it's easy to ignore that problem. It's easy to ignore the pain and suffering. It's easy to say, well, when did we see you hungry? Or when did we see you naked? Or when did we see you thirsty? That's another passage, isn't it? It's easy to avoid it from afar, but when you get up close, when you get near, you can't avoid it. You have to make a decision. And the Samaritan saw the need and he said, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to do something about it. Like I said, he didn't just offer up a prayer, but he went to help this man. And he didn't just help him to his feet and he'd say, oh, well, I hope you get to feel, here, here's my cloak. I hope you get to feeling better. No. He attended to his needs. He poured wine on them. He wrapped them. He put them on his own animal. And he carried him in for care. It reminds me of, of several years ago, I was in Costa Rica. And I was in Costa Rica, and one of my team members uh, fell into a ravine and broke his leg, both bones in his legs, uh, sticking through. And uh, if you ever go on a mission trip, be sure and take duct tape. Because that's what I used to secure his leg, okay, sticks and duct tape. And then we took him, uh, it was, I don't know, two or three hours till I got him to the hospital. And then when I got him to the hospital, he had surgery. I took him to the hospital, and every morning I would have to, uh, well, I couldn't stay at the hospital, I had to stay in town. I'd go to the hospital, and I'd go down to the local pharmacy, and I would buy his antibiotics. And then I would take his antibiotics to the nurse and let her administer them. Two days, twice a day, for about four days, I did that. To make sure that I cared for him. That vision, that reminds me, that's of how this man cared for this, th th this guy that was in the ditch. How he cared for him. But what made me think about this, I knew this man. This was a friend of mine that I cared for. What if it was somebody I didn't know? Could I do that? Would I be willing to give the same care to that person as I would my friend? Imagine if it were someone you found lying in a ditch. The scripture says the next day he took out two denarius and he gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll repay you for whatever you spend. Now we read that and we think, oh, big deal. Throw a few coins in his pocket. But a denarius is a day's wage. A day's wage. Now a day's wage at the time of Jesus was from sunup to sundown. Okay? That's a long day. Sun up to sundown. This man was willing to give up two days' wages. But not only that, he said, listen to me, listen to me. Here, here is a blank check. Whatever he needs, you let me know. And I'll take care of it. Whatever you spend, I'll take care of it. Now, now I can see Jesus as he's telling this story. In my mind, I picture it, that Jesus is telling this story. And when he tells that, he just pauses. When I return, whatever you spend, let me know. 
And he just pauses. And he lets his story sink in. Now you, you, you think about everything that you've heard to this moment. There's an unknown person lying in the ditch dying. There's a stranger who goes to him, attends to his needs, puts him on in his car, takes him to the inn, sees to it that he's cared for. And then he goes away and he says, I'm going to come back. And if there's anything else, let me know. Let that sink in. You see, what Jesus does when he shares his stories with us, he leaves the response in our hands, don't he? Listen, listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says, which one of these three, which one of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And I think he just kind of looked at the lawyer. And, of course, the lawyer said, well, the one who showed him mercy. That's, that's pretty easy, isn't it? The one who showed him mercy. And I think Jesus just paused. We'll go and do likewise. And he just tells him, go and do likewise. Like I said, Jesus leaves the response in our hands. He don't tell you, well, Eric, you get out there and do it. You decide, Eric. You make a decision. Now, nothing's recorded in the scriptures of how this lawyer responded. We don't know. And also, the question of how we respond is left up to you and to me. How we're going to respond to this. But I want to go back to that original question. You remember what it was that, that the lawyer asked of Jesus? His question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's what he asked. Did you notice what it wasn't? It has nothing to do with being religious. Well, wait a minute, preacher. How can you say that? Well, the priest was religious. I mean, he did the sacrifices. He did all that. The priest was religious, and he considered himself righteous in the eyes of God. He was clean in the eyes of the people. He was a religious and righteous person. But I'm here to tell you, you can, you can be religious all you want to, you can consider yourself righteous all you want to. You can have all the religion you want and still fail to inherit the eternal life. I was teaching a disciple Bible study in prison. And there was a man in the Bible study with me. And he said, listen, preacher, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, he said listen, I practice all the major religions. He says, I practice Christianity, Buddhism, Zionism, Muslim, and Judaism. I got them all covered. Yeah. He said, I want all the bases covered, so I'm here to tell you, religion's not the answer. It's not the answer. But likewise, I don't want you to be confused in believing that it's who you are. Sometimes we think more of ourselves, don't we? It's not who you are. The Levites, the Levites, as I told you, they considered themselves as being singled out by God. We're a special group of people. All the high priests and the priests, they come from us. We didn't bow down to the golden calf. We're special. They weren't special. No. They weren't singled out by who they were. But it was how God desired to use them. Listen to me. Eternal life, it doesn't come by association. It's not by association. It's not by who your mom or your dad or your grandma or your grandpa. Who they are. 
That's not what it's about. They might have been fine pillars of the church. They might have been very dedicated people of the church. But that doesn't guarantee you what you're looking for. It's not about how many committees you sit on. It's not about how much you do in the church. And it's not even about how much you contribute to the church. You know, you see, listen, Jesus says, I want to make it very clear, and here's what he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now look here, he says that on that day, many will say to me, many, did they not hear what he said? You remember what I said about testing Jesus? On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many deeds of power in your name? But he says, then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. What are you talking about? It's all about doing the Father's will. That's what it's about. It's all about everything else will fall in place if we get the first thing right. You see, when Jesus asked the lawyer, he said, man, he says, what is it? He says, here's what it is. He said, you've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And your neighbor is yourself. There it is. If you look at the story, that Samaritan, he saw a man in need. He saw himself in that ditch. And he said, if I was in that ditch, I would want somebody to help me. If I was bleeding, I would want somebody to pour wine on my wounds. If I was struggling, I would want somebody to manage. I would want somebody to take care of me. I would want somebody to love on me. That's what he saw. And in his mind, it didn't matter the cost. It didn't matter the consequences. And when you love God, with your total self. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Now, if you recall what Jesus, uh, the uh, response to the lawyer, you, you remember what Jesus' response would be? When, when, when the lawyer first quotes that passage of Scripture, you know what Jesus says? Do this and you'll live. That's what he says. Do this and you'll live. And then Jesus, Jesus tells the whole story, and he says, which of these three was the neighbor? And he said, well, the one, that, the one that had mercy on the man. And you know what Jesus said? Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Yeah. Folks, let me, let me share a few of Jesus' neighbors. You know, Jesus had a bunch of neighbors. I'm going to share a few. First of all, he had these neighbors. They were named James, John, Andrew, and Peter. You remember those neighbors? Well, Jesus was walking along in his neighborhood there on a Sea of Galilee. He was walking along in the neighborhood, and he looked out there, and he saw these, these fishermen out there, and he said, Hey, neighbor, have you caught anything? And he said, Oh, no, we've been fishing all night long, and we ain't caught a thing. And he said, Listen to me. Row out in the deep and cast over to the side, and you'll catch some fish. And they did. And what happened? Jesus said, come follow me. And they followed him. Yeah. And he was walking along the neighborhood one day, and he, he, he come along, and he was walking through the neighborhood, and he come upon this tax collector, and his name was Matthew. And Matthew was collecting taxes. Now, Matthew had been, he, he was an outcast. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with Matthew because he was the old tax collector. And Jesus said, hey, Matthew, what are you doing? Well, I'm collecting taxes. He said, why don't you come follow me? And Matthew left it all behind, and he followed him. Yeah. He wasn't an outcast. 
Jesus saw Matthew as his neighbor. What about the man that was demon-possessed? You remember him, don't you? Legions. He said, hey, neighbor, what's wrong? He said, I'm possessed with all these demons. And, and Jesus said, well, listen, you demons, leave him alone. He took pity on him. And he cast the demons into the swine. And the man was healed. Which brings us to the woman at the well. He was just in the neighborhood, sitting there in the well, waiting for a drink of water. woman comes along. She gives him a cup of water. And Jesus said, well, listen, why don't you go call your, your husband? She said, oh, I don't have a husband. I've had five husbands. And he offered the one thing she couldn't have. Yeah. Told her everything, but he didn't reject her, did he? That was his neighbor. How about the woman in the act of adultery? He's just in the neighborhood, and they come dragging this woman up before him and said, Look, here, we've caught her in the act of adultery. Let's stone her to death. Jesus put himself into that woman's place, didn't he? Yeah. Do you see what I'm trying to tell you? The truth is that in the eyes of Jesus, everyone was his neighbor. In fact, Jesus gave his life. For the neighborhood. Yeah. And the words of Jesus, the words are, For God so loved the world that, that he gave his only Son, that whoever believeth in him, in the name of Jesus, will not perish, but have eternal life. Yeah. He was just in the neighborhood, and he gave us life. To be able to love God fully and completely. Folks, that's a hard thing to do. Now, there's some people that really, I'll be honest with you, there's some people that says, boom, I'm giving it all to God, and they surrender completely and fully, and, and God just takes them all in. But there's other people like me that we're like an onion. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and we have to be peeled. Yeah, those layers have to come down. And it takes time. It takes time. But I serve a patient God. And God says, if, you, if you'll commit to me, I'll peel those layers away. If you'll let me, I'll get down to the core of this thing. If you'll trust me. To where you can completely die to self and live for God. Jesus says the only way to the Father, the only way to the Father, the only way to truly love God is through the Son. So if, you really, if you're really intent, if you're really interested and want to know how to inherit eternal life, my invitation to you is very simple. Very simple. Come to Jesus. There's a song about that, isn't there? It even says, come to Jesus and live. That's the invitation I'm giving to you. When you come to Jesus and you die to self, you are born of water and spirit, which allows you to see that neighbor as yourself yeah and then you'll be willing to lend a helping hand won't you come to Jesus you know folks now's the time we're living we're living in an unchartered world that we live in nobody knows what tomorrow holds but we know who holds tomorrow Okay? It's time for us as a church to begin to recognize we've got neighbors. And we need to begin to lend a hand. It'll take a sacrifice on our part. 
It's going to take time. It's going to take energy. And it's going to take resources. But I promise you that God will bless us in many ways if we will honor Him and love our neighbor as ourselves. Let's pray. Gracious God, Lord, we've been blind too long. We've walked around here like horses with blinders on. We've been deaf, Lord. We've refused to hear the cry of those around us for help. Lord, we, 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 we've come into our own little world, created our own little universe. Lord, we can't say any longer that, that you showed us that there's another way. And that's your way. Lord, open our eyes. Open our ears. Open our hearts. Lord, free us from this self-absorbed person that we are to become richer and fuller, to be godlike. In every way. We thank you Lord. For being our God. And we thank you. For all you do. And we pray this. In the name of Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing. One of the things that we did uh, neglect this morning. Was that our Love Denver Change for Change collection. Is this afternoon. um, Right after service. So as you're heading out the door, you'll have ladies there with buckets. Any change that you have in your pocket, any dollar bills that you have in your pocket, if you would graciously hand those over so that we may be able to love on Denver this year. Go by heaven's hands and multiply God all that I am and find my heart on the altar again set me on fire set me on fire yep. Yep. take all I Having these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again. Set me on fire, set me on fire. Here I am, God, arms wide.
Jesus now. All to Jesus now. Holding nothing back. Holding nothing back. I surrender. Oh! Uh-huh. 